All right, so next up, please join me in welcoming Brian Lewis, who will be talking about parallel computing with R using for each, future, and other packages. All right, well, uh, yeah, people are shuffling in and out. Um, yeah, first, uh, it goes without saying that it's a huge privilege for me to be able to hang out with so many cool people and interesting people. It's not, I normally don't get to hang out with cool people. So it, I'd really like to thank Joe and Hadley and JJ and everyone at our studio for making that possible. And can you all hear me okay? Because I'm going to talk really fast because i got a ton of slides, right? So I'm, I can't, but it really is a lot of slides. So <laughs> I'm not loud, so okay. Can you turn it up just slightly so they can hear me better, guys? Okay. Um, all right. Uh, actually, wow, it's crowded. All right, let's begin. So you're writing some R code, or maybe you're working on an R package, and your package is a super big data number crunching science package, right? So you're really, really interested and worried about performance of your code, and you need to study this. So maybe you pick up Pat Burns' excellent book, The R Inferno, and you learn a lot from this book, tons of performance tips about R and lots of other interesting nuggets about the R language, but the book kind of scares you a little bit. So then you move on to Hadley's book, right, and you learn even more about the R language and in particular about performance, and you also stroke your chin thoughtfully as you ponder all those Donald Knuth quotations in the book, <laughs> right? And after studying these things for a long time, You've become expert in vectorization and bytecode compilization and all of these things. And finally, you, 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 with great anticipation, you get to run your package, and it runs really, really slow. <laughs> it's very, very cute. Your package is super cute, but it's also super, super slow. Right? And then you remember, oh, wait, I've got our studio, and they've got all these newfangled profiling tools, the profviz and other things that help you look at your R codes, visualize your R code, see where it's spending all this time. So you load up your, your, uh, your package into our studio, and you run profviz, and you look at where you're spending all your time in code, and you notice that your package is spending a lot of time in these loop-like structures like L applies, or maybe replicates, or reduces, or maps, or, or is it map? Which one is it? Yeah, one of those, anyway. And, and, um, and then, and, then it, and then it strikes you, of course. I spent all this crazy amount of money on my super, super fancy Mac Pro Escalade, which has got a zillion CPU cores, and all those LApply loops that I'm running are only using a single CPU. But of course, this is R, and you realize there's a package for that, the parallel package, right? And it even comes with R, right? So of course, this is, this is what I'll use. So with renewed vigor, you go back into your package, and you, you look at all your LApplies, and you change all of the LApplies to MIC LApplies, and you change all your maps to MIC maps. All the while, you're thinking, what if McDonald's sues for trademark infringement? You know, I mean, <laughs> Simon Urbanic is going to be in some serious trouble, right? And um, so uh, anyway, you get all this done, and finally, you're ready to run your package again. And it's, it blows your mind. It's running so fast that your Mac Pro Escalade is glowing red hot. It's ripping through your data, big science code, really super fast. You've never seen R or even your Mac perform like this before. It's fantastic, right? So you tell all your friends about it. You're so excited. Everybody wants to use your package. And so your friend Jared Lander, he calls you up, and he's excited about running your package. So you give your package to Jared. And of course, Jared's using a Windows laptop. And when he runs it, it doesn't work, right? You know, <laughs> because Windows, right? <laughs> And then you think, well, yeah, wait, though, there's not those, those parallel package functions, not all of them work on all the operating systems, especially Windows. So you tell Jared, you know, that's not a problem, Jared. I'll just rip out some of my L applies and I'll replace them with cluster whatever applies, right? And I'll get it all to work for you on your Windows machine. And you do that and it works fine. Meanwhile, while you're working on that, your other friend, that's right, you've only got two friends, your other friend, <laughs> George Ostrichov, he, 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 he's really excited about your package, too, and he's got... Of course, he's got this super peta exit computer in his garage down there in Tennessee somewhere in the Appalachian Mountains, and he wants to run it, and you start talking about George, and you're excited to run it on such a big computer, but you realize you've got to run it using uh, something called MPI, because George says real HPC programmers use MPI, you know, whatever. 
but there's a package for that too, right? There's this R MPI package, so you start rewriting your code again, and you look, and this is harder this time because this, this, this MPI stuff is really tricky, and it's like it's taking a bit of it's taking quite a bit of while. And meanwhile, this is it's snowballing. Other people are asking, well, what about this? What about this? Can I run it on that? Can I run it on that? And before long. You're losing friends and your family's pissed off at you because you're spending all of your time staring at an R Studio console, maintaining like 50 versions of your package for all these different parallel distributed network uh, runtime systems, right? It's driving you crazy. And then, you know, you're neurotic, right? So you start to get really worried about this. And you're like, well, what, you know, what if I lose friends over this? I might start losing sleep and then maybe I would get depressed. I could lose my job. That would probably lead inevitably to a life of crime and woe. And then uh, finally, you have a vision of yourself as a crazy old person on a street corner ranting and raving about lazy evaluation. <laughs> dark, it's dark, dark thoughts. <laughs> this, this is the situation we found ourselves in in 2008. And my friend and uh, at the time my colleague, Steve Weston, he looked back at this problem and he thought there's, there's got to be a better way, a different way, a, a different approach. What if package authors and code writers could decide which parts of their program can run in parallel, and separately later, the users of those packages decide how those uh, codes should run in parallel based on their circumstances and available resources. This is the philosophy of For Each. And it's a philosophy, it's a philosophy shared by Henrik's uh, more, much more recent future package. And it's a, it's a very, very important point because we abstract away the uh, implementation of a particular parallel portion of our code and leave that up to the user to, to decide uh, at runtime how things should run. Now, back in 2008, Steve made the decision to, to syntactically structure for each uh, in the form of a for loop. And because back then, Steve was really uh, enamored of... Um, of uh, list comprehensions and set comprehensions and all these kinds of Haskell-y things, right? He was really into that. S speaking of Haskell, um, you, know, you know the Reticulate package and how beautifully it integrates Python with, with R? It's lovely, right? Have you, have you used Reticulate? Wouldn't it be really cool if somebody did that with, with R and Haskell, right? And they could call it Rascal. I would really like that. That, that, would, be, that would be an excellent package. But, but back to for each. Um, <laughs> D despite its for loop syntax, um, for each really kind of works like uh, a, r a reduce of a map. And let, let's make that concrete by looking at a really kind of simple contrived example. Here's a for each loop, and I'll explain each part. Um, for each is a function, and these iteration variables i and j in the blue circle, they, they kind of play the role of any old iterator variable in a regular old for loop. Um, and, and we can supply a reduction function using this dot combine argument, and, and that can be any function you want of two or more arguments. And in this case, I'm just using the rbind function. And then in the purple circle, there's just a regular old r expression. It can be any r expression you want, and it can use those iterator variables. And in our case, we're just going to run over the unique values of i and j. Each iteration of the loop is going to produce a single row data frame, and we'll pass it to rbind. And if we run, but, but wait, there's this weird mysterious operator, do par, that takes like a function call on one side and our, our expression on the other. It's kind of bizarre. If we run this, um, well, big surprise. You know, we have two loop iterations. Each one emits a single row of a data frame. They're passed into our bind, and our ultimate output is a two row data frame. Rocket science. So, uh, but we also get this interesting warning message from do par. And that's Dupar telling us, look, man, you, you, you know, you didn't tell me that you could run it in parallel or, or you wanted to run it in parallel. So just so you know, this was one run on a plain old se sequential R session. And that's what Dupar does. That strange operator is effectively the API of the for each package. It's the glue that takes your R uh, uh, statements and variables and puts them together with, with uh, various ways to run those things in parallel, like MPI or whatever. Um, and that, that's the abstraction layer, the, the API. And so here's an example of that. Uh, a user then can register a particular parallel adapter package, in this case, do parallel, with this registration function. And do par sees that through, through a hidden global variable somewhere. And now the loop, without changing the code in any way, runs and gives you the same answer but this time it's run in parallel. In, in this example, two separate R processes were started for each loop iteration 
their output was combined through the R bind function to give you the same, the same result. That's the philosophy of for each and the future package uh, in a nutshell. Thanks to Henrik's amazing work, uh, the future package um, is, is like a new extension of this idea. And it doesn't, it, it just doesn't give you an, any, there's no, unlike uh, for each where you have a, you know, a very opinionated syntactical structure of a for loop, future package lets you do things like this using any type of R syntax that you want. You can use regular old for loops, L applies, maps, the other map, replicate, no loop at all. You can do anything you want to do. And the cool thing is that both the future package and the for each package use magic. They do. <laughs> they auto-magically detect and make sure that uh, lexically scoped R objects are available to the worker processes. So in this case, it's the same loop we were running before, except notice there's this K variable at the top that's not defined within the body, the expression that's in the loop. And for each and Dupar are smart enough to identify that and say, wait a minute, that, that worker process is gonna need that value. I make sure that, I'll, that it has it, uh, even though it's defined lexic in a lexical scope. And sure enough, it works. And that'll work if you're running it on the same computer or if you're running it across your departmental network or if you use an AWS to run it across the, the country or even if you're running it on another planet, right? It'll all just work magically. It's really, really quite amazing. There are a few other kind of interesting things about the for each package that are more esoteric. You can compose two for each loops together with a composition operator, then that produces a, a, a third for each loop. And that can be really useful for nested parallelism. Um, to make it work actually in a more predictable way. Um, and going back to the Haskelly ideas, you can compose a for each loop with the kind of a, a predicate filtering operation to produce uh, the when function in this case to produce uh, a set comprehension, a very Haskelly kind of thing. Um, and Steve was very much into those ideas. Um, See where we at now. Again, thanks to this amazing guy right here, who's going to talk about the future package, and just in the very next talk. So y'all should stick around. Um, future works interoperably with for each through the do future parallel adapter package, uh, as do a number of other older uh, parallel adapters that are listed there. Um, before this talk. Uh, I went and updated some that I haven't, I've been neglecting for a while. The do Redis and do MPI, uh, MPI and Redis backends for for each are recently updated and they're either on CRAN now or they're kind of pending uh, into CRAN. And I've got a, I started writing kind of hacking together a guide uh, to explain the internals of for each to prospective uh, parallel adapter authors. If you want to write your own parallel adapter to connect to your super duper fancy you know, whatever multi-GPU computer thing, you can do that, and uh, there's a little guy there that helps walk you through what, what, you know, how to dot the I's and cross the T's. Now, I have to say, I, I believe that this is a vitally important addition to the R software eco ecosystem. It really fills a, a gap, or it filled back in 2009 when we introduced it. It filled a gap that was really missing in R, and it's been, it's been very important, and, and uh, that's why I've tried to support it a little bit in a limited capacity here and there over the years. But you don't have to take my word for that. All you need to do is go on CRAN and uh, look at the for each page, and you can see all of these R packages that either depend explicitly or implicitly on for each, and there's a lot of them, right? So there's a huge impact um, from this software. And that's, that's really makes me quite happy, um, because as some of you know, uh, so we lost Steve last summer. He passed away, sadly. And, but he didn't, right? His ideas are, were, were as vital today to the R software ecosystem and um, spawning new work by new people uh, as they were, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, so I think it's a testament to Steve's uh, vision how important this, uh, this work was. And this has been kind of a weird lightning introduction to an abstraction layer for parallel computing. I know I didn't go very deep into things, but I'm going to conclude this talk because I don't want to burden you with all of these super technical details. I'll leave that to Henrik. Uh, but I'll, I'd like to conclude the talk in kind of a weird, characteristically weird way, right? I'll, I'll paraphrase uh, the great labor organizer and folk singer, Steve was also into folk music, Joe Hill. And on Joe's deathbed, he said, don't mourn, don't mourn my passing. Uh, parallelize, well, he didn't say parallelize, but Steve would have said parallelize. So that's all I have for you. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Brian. Yeah. We have, we have a number of minutes left, so. Uh, yeah, it was pretty quick. So. Yeah, if you want to ask any more questions, we've got some room on Slido here. Um, so as the author of this package, I'm, I'm kind of curious about your answer. Uh, what do you think about the fur package as the combination of per and future? Uh, yeah, I think, so, so the functional uh, concepts, uh, I mean, you can see me, I mentioned in Haskell, right? So, so you know, having uh, side effect free operations whenever possible that are promoted by things like the pure package um, are important and they're in fact essential for embarrassingly parallel style map reduce computation that we get with, with future and, and with for each. So I think, you know, it's a natural fit actually. That's, that's really what I have to say about it. Right. Yeah. Um, one other question here. So this is just kind of technical, but how do we assign the number of cores to be used? Yeah, that's up to the, 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 the parallel adapter code. I mean, that's the point. At runtime, the user can make a decision. So if you're just using the R's native parallel package, you would supply a number. When you say register, I had that slide up there that said register do parallel. And if you just put a number in there, that's the number of cores it's going to use. And, and, and you know, that's, of course, depend. If you're using an MPI backend, you've got a different convention. Or if you're using Redis or one of these other job queuing systems or whatever, they all have slightly different conventions with dealing how, how the work is going to be run. Right. Yeah. Um, so a couple more just popped in. Um, are there any recommendations about debugging when using parallel computing? Oh, that's a great question, actually. Yeah, it's, uh, it's challenging, right? Parallel, distributed computing and parallel computing in general is nightmarishly complicated to debug. Um, and and um, there are, uh, yeah, there are, the, the, in both uh, uh, the, the future work and in for each, there are, are various tricks that you can use to help debug your code. There's an option in for each to uh, stop on the first error that's encountered on any worker uh, process anywhere and throw that error in the R session. That's its de default. But you can also just pass the errors as they come. So if you're getting lots of errors in your iterate loop iterations, you can just see all of them uh, to see what's happening. And you can also, this is probably not advisable, but you can also ignore errors. And depending on the, the the back ends, the, the, the kind of adapter packages, the ones that, that work with the standard R parallel package and MC packages, they don't do so well at, at uh, debugging. But uh, some of the other parallel adapters uh, have provisions in them for logging and maintaining uh, logs to you know, just regular R connections. So you can direct logs to files on the back end workers and inspect those after. Um, you know, or, to, or, or, or if you have the ability to look at standard error, standard out, you can, you can actually look at those as it's running on the, on the other workers, too, to help debug. But it's still tricky, and I'm sure this guy's going to have a lot more to say about that. Or do you have more to say about it, Henrik? I don't know. It's hard, right? It's hard. Maybe, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put any pressure on you there. Um, okay, so I think we still have some more time. Um, so I had a question, and if Max Kuhn is in here, I'm sure he'd be proud of me for asking. Yeah. There's Max. Um, so he and I are really interested in getting messages kind of back in real time, like any warnings or error messages coming back in real time from your workers. Like, is that even possible, depending on? Well, in, I don't know about future. In 4-H, you can throw an error, and that's coming back in real time if you pass the errors through, right? So, so that, that would be the only way to do that right now on any, uh, in, in for each in an abstract way. Uh, like warnings and messages maybe where it's still continuing to run, like that didn't stop yeah, the worker. Yeah, no, yeah, that's a great question and I don't know of any facility for doing that. That would be, to, you'd need some extra communication channel off the main channel to, to send that information through. You could do it through files, but you know, you may not have access to files. You know, if they're running on another planet, right. maybe you can't get those, right? So uh, I don't know, that's a, it's a tricky one, Max. I figured you would ask something tricky like that. Okay, let's thank Brian one more time. Thank you all.